Okay, so good afternoon and welcome to this, the African Mining Summit virtual event. My name is John Borshoff and I'll be chairing the energy fuel panel session to discuss uranium and why it is different at this time uh, with particular focus on Africa. As indicated in the conference agenda papers, apart from touching on the state of the nuclear industry globally, we will also explore in the short time available if and how Africa will play an increasingly more important part in this vital clean air and safe, for safe industry, both in terms of the supply of uranium and electricity generation. It is fast becoming apparent in this world of climate change. The quest for zero emissions, population growth, and ever increasing need for more and more electricity that is essential to have, and that is essential to have a continuous reliable uh, supply of electricity with increasing requirement for more clean nuclear to counteract the equally important but highly intermittent solar and wind technologies. We have just heard the keynote address from Daniel Major, CEO of Urania, uh, Glo uh, Goviex Uranium, talking on the nuclear future and position for African uranium resources, which addresses this issue, making an excellent segue for our panel discussions. I hope we will have an invigorating and highly informative session, and I'm pleased to say we have ver three very experienced people on our panel today who have worked in the uranium sector for a long time and will give valuable understandings and insights to explore the topic at hand. These are Andre Leibenberg, CEO of Yellowcake, Brandon Munro, MD of Bannerman Resources, and Murray Hill, MD of Marinica Energy. These gentlemen will, in the three or four minutes available to them, introduce themselves, their companies, and each will give a short insight into certain aspects of this fascinating industry to set a fertile basis for the Q&A discussions to follow. To get the ball rolling, I will firstly describe a little on myself, what I do, and raise some points I think relevant to what is shaping our industry, particularly on the supply side. I will not be repeating my bio, which you can see in the conference papers as for all the panelists. I have been active in, this, in the sector for over 40 years, worked for several multinational uranium companies in the 70s and early 90s, and then founded Paladin, which became a significant uranium producer in the pre-Fukushima era, developing two uranium mines, one in Namibia and the other in Malawi. It gained a 7% share, market share, and this company became an investment sensation. Apart from Kaz Adamprom, a government-based organisation, Paladin was the only junior listed company to have achieved global significance, having brought the first and second modern conventional uranium mine operation into existence in the first decade of 2000, after the wilderness from mid-80s uh, when Chernobyl accident occurred. I have been managing director of an ASX listed company called Deep Yellow for the past three and a half years, running a dual strategy for growth, focusing on getting the company's existing projects into development stage and on sector consolidation using management and technical team I had in Paladin and taking opportunity uh, of the uranium downturn to build the company utilising a contrarian investment approach. You are welcome to visit the Deep Yellow virtual booth that provides all information that you need should you be interested. With this said, now to the panel members. So firstly, over to you, Andre. Please tell us a bit about yourself, what Yellowcake does, and since your company is accumulating Yellowcake cheaply, hopefully, during a period of uranium downturn, to sell at higher prices later, 
How do you think uranium supply situation will assist your business model? And when do you believe uranium prices uh, will escalate to counter the looming supply shortage? John, thank Andre. you very much uh, for the intro. Um, my name is Andre Liebenberg. I have spent the last 25 years in the resources sector, starting out in investment banking. I was with uh, BHP for 15 years. After that, uh, into private equity. Uh, we invested in a gold mine in, in uh, your host country, Namibia. So understand that region a little bit. Uh, after the uh, session with the uh, private equity firm, I got involved with the setup of Yellow Cake in early 2017. And in July 2018, we uh, listed Yellow Cake on the London Stock Exchange. And then I took up the full time role as CEO with that company. Um, so let me talk a little bit about Yellow Cake and, and why it was set up. Yellow Cake was established on the thesis that uh, the uranium price was unsustainably low. You know, uranium is a commodity, commodities are cyclical. And we took the view that uh, uranium was much closer to the bottom of the cycle than the top of the cycle. And, and you know, why did we think this? Uh, we'd had an extended period of low prices. And back in 2018, when you looked at uh, the existing production, and if, you, if all that existing production earned the then spot price, about half the production sector would be loss making. So, you know, say for the long-term contracts, which, which kept a lot of these companies in business, you had a price which didn't support existing activities. Um, and then uh, on the demand side, it, you know, demand is very visible. These reactors take a long time to build, and we saw a steady and growing demand side. Uh, in 2016, uh, some of the big producers started making production cuts. In, in the face of these, um, you know, low spot prices and, and uh, long-term contracts which started rolling off. But I think a, a less visible and, and a bigger part of the supply side is the underinvestment in future supply. So, you know, production Michael? cuts were very visible and, right. and uh, the market saw that, that, that quite quickly. But the underinvestment in future supply we thought uh, set this commodity up for a, for a future supply crunch and prices have, have to respond, we believe, to induce uh, you know, new production. Existing mines are operating, and, but they're finite resources and, and they deplete over time. So you know, we, we believe that this industry is much more about supply side issues than about demand side issues. Um, Yellow Cake is a corporate vehicle uh, if you look at its balance sheet, we've got 9.3 million pounds of uh, physical uranium and some cash. That's it. We don't have any operations. We've got two employees. Uh, we've outsourced a lot of our administrative activities in order to keep the cost base very low. So what we hope to do is to provide investors with a pure uh, way of investing in the uranium commodity. Thanks, John. Thank you, Andre. And there's some interesting things to follow up on there. So, Murray, now over to you, and please a bit about yourself, your company, and maybe you can touch on what the challenges you feel the sector is facing, especially with regard to new uranium mining development, particularly conventional mines, and the need to support innovation in processing, especially with conventional mines. We can, op we can pick that up also later in the uh, panel session. Over to you. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, I'm a metallurgist by profession. I was consulting to extract resources on the HUSAB project for about five years before that was sold. And I did some consulting to the Berkeley project uh, in Spain uh, until I then joined uh, Maranica about eight years ago uh, as CEO and then MD. Uh, and the focus back then was uh, we had a single project, um, a project that was under underwater in terms of its, its grade. It was 93 ppm. Uh, and compared to the only operating mine on Calcrete style ore that Maranica is uh, being Langer Heinrich with a cutoff grade of 250 ppm, uh, meant that this project really had, uh, you know, costs in, in the order of plus $80 a pound. So we had to do something. Uh, we had to do something innovative. Um, you know, a single project company with a very low grade asset with a high cost, uh, you don't survive um, when the uranium price is below 100 plus dollars a pound. So. For us, it was uh, it was 
out of necessity we had to innovate and that's what we did. So we developed um, an upgrade beneficiation process uh, which is now uh, fully developed in-house, patented and is a centrepiece of the company at the moment. So we built a strategy around that, a strategy of um, acquiring assets and exploration in Namibia. So uh, our exploration program in Namibia is um, on the largest nuclear fuel land package in the country. Uh, and we acquired that strategically by um, picking up uh, ground upstream of known calcrete deposits. And, and I will say that the upgrade process is applicable to calcrete deposits and not so much the, the um, hard rock such as Bannermans and Tango's projects, which Brandon will talk about shortly. So we're focusing on old riverbeds um, and that's why we're looking upstream. That's why the reference to upstream. So we've, uh, we've been successfully exploring Namibia. We've picked up, uh, oh, sorry, we've found the, the copies deposit, which is upstream of uh, your tumus deposit, John. And it looks to us from the uh, grades to date that it's somewhere in the order of uh, similar to yours at 300 and 350 ppm. And uh, we've just announced a new discovery at Hitterbeb. Uh, it's an EPL that's 16 times larger than copies and we've found a paleo channel, the length of the, the English channel in width. So it's a, it's a fairly significant um, uh, pickup and discovery and very exciting from a blue sky perspective. Uh, Namibia is a great place to be. We'll talk about that at, uh, through this uh, hour. And uh, you know, we know how supportive the government is in Namibia. We've got a very supportive Namibian Uranium Association headed by Dr. Garby Schneider. Uh, it's, a, it's an established uranium industry with Rossing having operated for the last 44 years continuously. So it's a great jurisdiction to be in and, and we're, we're excited to be there. The other prong to our strategy was acquiring assets and we just picked up 48 million pound of um, high, higher grade assets in Australia, uh, which we're working to add value with, uh, value too, sorry, through, through application of upgrade and also uh, through um, some geological work on it. So really the key to our survival through this low uranium price environment uh, and, and through our current growth phase is our ability to innovate. Uh, through development of upgrade. Now, upgrade lowers the capex and opex by 50% compared to conventional processing methods. So that means that at least the uranium project has, uh, Maranek uranium project in, in its own right, has an opportunity uh, with upgrade to be developed at a higher uranium price. But it also uh, it enables us to develop lower grade and small deposits that wouldn't normally be operated. So for us, it's a catalyst for exploration and uh, in Namibia, and it's also the ca catalyst for us to acquire assets in Australia. So really the challenges that the industry faced and we faced you know, eight years ago was, what do you do when you've got a low grade asset uh, with a high cost, um, you know, where do you go? And, and innovation was where we went. And I think the industry has to look at innovation. So as you say, we'll, we'll probably talk more about that shortly, um, but uh, you know, I think that a lot of the future of the uranium processing and other commodities for that matter is thinking outside the box through innovation, whether it be processing or mining, um, you know, there's many ways that we can we can add value. Thanks, John. Thanks, Murray. And I guess it's, it's not a question of uh, whether we need more uranium. I think that's absolutely a certainty. And I agree, um, getting new operations uh, built using modern processing technologies, which I hope in, the, in our discussion will broaden much more outside as also, uh, because it's an industry question, not just a company issue. Um, and it's vital uh, to get this development phase after so many years in the doldrums. And, uh, and it's a situation that offers everybody uh, uh, good opportunities. Uh, finally, uh, Brandon, something on yourself, Bannerman, the company you run. And it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on whether you feel the large mosaic of countries making up Africa can become increasingly uh, more important participants in the uranium supply sector and even the nuclear uh, uh, industry generally. Over to you. So I'm Brandon Munro. I'm the CEO of Bannerman Resources Limited. We're an ASX listed uranium development company. And since 2006, we've been entirely focused on the Itango Uranium Project in Namibia. It's a very large uranium project. In fact, it has a total resource of 271 million pounds. And uh, until very recently, we'd been planning to develop that project at a rate of 7.2 million pounds per annum, which puts us right up there with the very largest of the potential mines in the world for uranium. It's a very advanced project as well. 
We've completed all of our environmental work and we have our environmental and social permits. And uh, as I say, we carried that work all the way through to a definitive feasibility study and also built a pilot plant, which you can see over my shoulder there, the heat bleach demonstration plant. Um, but what I'm really excited to say is just very recently, we have published the Itango 8 scoping study. And what that is, John, as you know, is we have now reimagined the enormous Itango project at a uh, slightly reduced throughput of 3.5 million pounds. And we've been able to do that in order to reduce the development hurdles so that we can be in production sooner. And we still have the capacity to upscale that project, if need be, all the way back up to those levels of seven million pounds per annum or so. So it's been a really exciting few months for us at Bannerman and, and for Namibia as well. And we're looking forward very much to progressing that through the PFS and DFS and uh, currently targeting being in production in around 2025. Now, as for your question on Africa, look, Africa really does have an important role to play in this market. The first thing about that is Africa offers a vital form of diversification into this sector. Uh, the sector is very concentrated. People who followed uranium would know that Kazatomprom, uh, through itself and its joint ventures, produce 40% of the world's uranium. So enormously concentrated from just one country. And then behind that is Canada, which is concentrated commercially into Cameco, the second largest producer in the world. And traditionally, it's then been Namibia as the fourth largest producer of uranium and Niger as the fifth largest producer of uranium that have balanced out the um, dominance by Kazatomprom and Cameco. Now that's uh, developed in an unusual way in the last couple of years because Namibia's two giant mines, being the Rossing uranium mine and the more recent Husab uranium mine have been bought by Chinese interests. So it's a very crucial part of the go forward supply equation that Africa reasserts itself as a diversified form of supply that enables the nuclear fuel buyers in this sector to relieve themselves of this geographical and commercial concentration that we're seeing. And I think we're all on this panel because we want to play a role in that important supply function. Uh, the other comment about Africa, as you say, John, it is a mosaic and it offers a mosaic of various uranium projects. Um, but other than South Africa and Malawi, uh, no, other country has in the modern era produced uranium in Africa. So that's both a big challenge for newcomer countries, but also a real opportunity for Africa to play a bigger role through develop new countries, new coming countries, playing a bigger role developing and supplying uranium into what we all agree is a vitally important sector. Thank you, Brandon. Very good. And uh, we'll certainly be picking up on some of those very good points you made. So now we've set the scene and uh, with our panel, uh, building also on Daniel's excellent keynote uh, address. And I'd like to get the ball rolling, starting with a question to Andre. Andre, in your talk, and I saw in your uh, very good presentation on your web, uh, that uh, yellow cake, it's got a really sound basis. And uh, I noticed that you sold a little uranium uh, a while back. And uh, uh, does that mean that there's a change of strategy there or is it just part of um, the, uh, the sort of build opportunity? And uh, if you could explain some of that, thanks. Thanks, John. <clears throat> you know, as I mentioned, our, our strategy is long term buy and hold. Um, you know, investors and, and, and participants in the market should not view our store of uranium as something that that would come back onto the spot market very, very quickly. Uh, you know, we, we want to uh, build this, this, this uh, business out, particularly while we believe uranium prices are low. However, um, you know, if you look at the, the assets we have uh, versus our share price, um, we were trading at a very significant discount to, to our net asset value, which, which quite frankly did, didn't make any sense. 
if you think about the uranium we hold, which is effectively one step away from cash, and we had cash, that's, that's all we had in our balance sheet. Um, so we, when our, our discount uh, got to over 30%, um, in, in March uh, on the back of, of the equity markets uh, uh, impact on, on COVID or the, the impact of COVID on the equity markets, um, we decided to, to sell some uranium to buy back our stock. And I think, you know, the, the message to, to the market was we, we demonstrated or wanted to demonstrate, A, that the board wasn't satisfied and happy sitting on a, on a large discount to net asset value. It wanted to be pro proactive. Also, what we wanted to demonstrate is that the uranium we hold is effectively one step away from cash. So we sold you know, a, a small amount, about 3% uh, of our holding, 300,000 pounds. We got the spot price and we got paid very, very quickly. I think importantly, we sold to a producer. We didn't sell it uh, to, to traders. We sold it to a producer that, that needed the material. So you know, in, in part, it was to, to demonstrate to the market that we, we could sell some, not that we wanted to, but, but more importantly, that we wouldn't tolerate a, a big discount to net asset value. And also, it, it was a, a cheap way of us buying uranium through, through our share price. Thank you. Um, and just uh, uh, another question. Uh, what I'll be doing is uh, talking, each question will be uh, specifically about your respective companies and then on the broader issue, which is what our panel is about uh, this afternoon. Um, and regarding the question of SMRs, how, how real do you think they are in terms of their development and, and, the, uh, and over what time frame do you think would you expect to see commercial operations? Uh, obviously, it's got big implications for Africa. Yeah. John, I, I think SMRs are, are very real. If you look at the governments that are putting effort in, in, into the technology, there's you know, the US, Canada, China, the UK to name but a few, and the companies, large companies that are investing in the space. There's Rolls-Royce, GE, Bechtel. So I, I truly believe that, that with that sort of effort going into, into this technology, that we will see commercial operations in the five to 10 year time horizon. And, and that's not very far away, um, you know, particularly if you have to marry that up with, with, with new supply because it takes time to develop mines. So I, I believe the technology is real, and I believe we will see copper, uh, commercial operations in the five to 10 year time horizon. Thank you. Uh, Brandon, a um, little bit about uh, something you said in your, in your intro uh, with your scoping study, uh, where uh, you've made that shift, I think importantly, to the 3.5 million per annum move. Um, how, how long do you think the, the following uh, sort of DFS upgrade will, will, will take you uh, and, um, and uh, do you think you'll be ready on time if there is a, a move along the time frames that you suggested uh, getting ready for production by 2025? Thanks John. It, it's actually a very pertinent question because um, as resource investors would understand, normally the move from a scoping study to a PFS has a number of very substantial pieces that involve both expense, but also risk, risk technically and risk to the outcome. Uh, like I said before, we've already done a DFS on a larger scale project. So we're very fortunate in that respect that we don't need to go through those big steps again. So the first of those is resource drilling. Uh, we've already drilled out an enormous resource of 271 million pounds. So we won't need to do any of that in the transition from scoping study to PFS. The second one is metallurgy. And we've run a demonstration plant or a pilot plant for three years already. And none of that has changed. That's only uh, getting better. So we don't need to progress metallurgy from a scoping study to PFS level. And finally, it's about this time in a project development when you'd be really getting after the environmental impact assessment. You'd be well and truly into your baseline studies and you'd be looking to start preparing for environmental approval. And again, I'm just so pleased to say that we don't need to do that. That was in fact uh, what I originally moved to Namibia for in the first time in 2009 to work for Bannerman on the uh, environmental impact and social impact uh, studies that we were doing at that time. So we still have those for a much larger scale project. 
and uh, the impact of a smaller scale project, of course, is less. So to answer your question, John, we think that we would have a PFS ready by the middle of next year. So about nine months, we expect that that would take. And we're also quite optimistic that progressing to a DFS, for all of those reasons, would also take about another nine months. And again, we're just so lucky to have such a detailed, high quality database of materials that's been worked on since 2006. What is really crucial for us and for you and the, uh, many of the producers out there is when the window comes, it's important to be able to deliver producible pounds into this sector. And that's a lot easier said than done because of all of the environmental constraints, political constraints, social constraints that exist in the uranium sector. Just ask somebody who operates in one of the states in Australia, for example, where uranium mining's banned at the moment. So for us and all of us in Namibia, we don't have those constraints. It's very well supported. So we think that uh, when we look at the progression on technical studies, uh, the, an allowance for marketing and financing, and then of course a construction period, in this case of 18 to 24 months, that accumulates into being in production towards the end of 2024 or the beginning of 2025. That's a good time in this market as far as I see it, because that's at the stage when we will see existing deficits in supply really expand out. And that's because of production depletion that will happen first of all in Kazakhstan, but also in Niger, in Australia, and even in Canada by 2028 as the enormous Cigar Lake mine runs out of resources. So because we have a number of existing older mines that are depleting their production or even closing down from 2024, we and the World Nuclear Association projects a very significant widening of a deficit that, let's face it, it produces an unsubstitutable fuel source for more than 10% of the world's electricity. So this world can't allow that deficit to persist. And of course, the response to that will be increased prices. And we'd hope to be in production at exactly the time when that price response really starts to take hold. Thank you. Uh, we'll come back to the broader question a bit later. Um, I, I Just very quickly to Murray, um, you, you describe your uh, sort of uh, process there with, with Maranika. Um, I guess you're at an early stage of resource development. There's a, there's a pretty good path, you know, that you've got ahead of you to get to reserve, you know, reserve status. And, um, and uh, I suppose you're looking at a similar timeline as what Brandon would be. Is that correct? Well, depends on which assets you talk about. I suppose the Australian assets, uh, as Brendan mentioned. No, I'm not talking the... about the Australian assets, only the African ones. I mean, okay, sorry. The, um, as far as the African assets go, I mean, we don't have uh, a resource uh, in our southern uh, area yet in terms of the Namia barrier. We've got the low-grade Maranica resource, uh, but that'll need a substantially higher uranium price plus 75 bucks a pound. So we're, we're um, you know, we're an exploration company purely at this point in time uh, in Namibia. Um, we're not in, we're not expecting to develop uh, for for probably four or five years potentially, uh, so we're sort of we're making up one cog of that chain that that you and Brandon talk about there in terms of you know production requirements with time. So we we'll, we'll um, hopefully as as we get uh, more exploration um, occurring at um, Hedabeb and we find there's a bit of uranium there, uh, you know we've got a couple of areas of focus. Do we go back and do a resource uh, drilling at campaign at at uh, Copies? Uh, at the moment, we've elected to, to do more blue sky exploration down at Hirabib as opposed to spending, you know, million dollars on, on a, a drill program to identify a resource. Because we know the uranium's there, uh, but we think there's a bigger bang for our buck in trying to identify potentially larger uh, uranium assets um, in Namibia. So, so our focus is to try and explore our EPLs, identify where there is mineralisation and, and how many areas we've got that we could come back to later and, and drill out quickly. It's not a long drilling process. You know, copies is probably two to three months of drilling to get a resource, an indicated resource. So it's not as though you're waiting for me and uh, sorry, uh, for a number of years to do so or millions and millions and millions of dollars. Uh, it's, it's a low cost, quick process. So, you know, if we wanted to kick off a study um, fairly quickly on copies, you know, two or three months of drilling and away you go. 
So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, a question for Andre, and this may lead to a bit of a panel discussion. Uh, Daniel, in his excellent talk, um, uh, said that uh, we just heard mentions the issues and challenges facing Africa in terms of uh, the continent's growing energy needs and the conflict between the zero emission strategies that most countries on that continent have committed to and the need for huge energy growth to improve the standard of living of an ever-growing population. And this is a stark sort of uh, two goalposts sitting on each side, very different. The solar is part of that solution, obviously, and nuclear with its, its unique qualities must be a partner. Even though the country is well endowed with gas and coal, uh, it is really forced to go into a, uh, uh, another energy strategy. You mentioned that the way, a way forward is with the uh, SMRs, and, um, but with that country having such a diverse GDP and some can afford and some can't, how, how do you think, it's a big question, how do you think that this continent can actually start modernising in its energy strategy, apart from the solar approach, which is intermittent. Yeah, John, <clears throat> I think Daniel made another important point, uh, which I didn't fully appreciate, is, is just the size of a, of a nuclear reactor rel relative to the demand and, and, and system stability. So, you know, that, that kind of uh, points you in the direction of SMRs. But I think firstly, Africa is a very large continent and building interconnectors is very, very expensive. You know, what, what happened in, in the, in the uh, telecom space is they didn't lay copper cables and fiber everywhere. They went mobile. You know, it was much cheaper to, to build uh, towers than it was to lay, lay copper. So, and I think SMRs lends itself to this you know, it's well suited to remote locations. And I think it's well suited to regional uh, systems that, that, that don't have uh, interconnectivity. You know, yes, the country or the continent has got uh, coal and, and gas reserves, but it's expensive to, to move coal and gas around. And you know, if you look at South Africa, the, the uh, power stations were built on top of the coal mines and then you had to build expensive interconnectivity. So I think um, SMRs uh, play a, an important role. I think the other aspect of um, the uh, uh, SMR and nuclear is the energy density of nuclear. It, it's, it's, it's much cheaper to move nuclear fuel around because of its very, very high energy density relative to, to oil and gas. So I think for those reasons, John, uh, SMRs uh, you know, are, are well suited uh, to, to, to the African development and African continent. Thank you. I agree. Uh, Brandon, have you got something to <clears throat> Yeah, I, look, I fully endorse what Andre just said. And another important point to do with SMRs is that as opposed to large conventional nuclear power plants that require really quite some expertise to operate, uh, SMRs, a number of their development models and uh, the different proposals being put together they have a much more encapsulated system where you don't need as many qualified scientists and other people on the ground to run. So I think for that reason, they also have an applicability in the near term in Africa. Um, it will take some time for African nations to develop the capability required to operate and run nuclear power plants. But uh, there are SMR models that, for example, arrive contained in a shipping container and then are simply removed at the end of their uh, useful life of 20 years or so. So they almost operate like a plug and play battery. So that additional um, assistance in terms of operating without a, an extremely high level of skills that are required for a conventional nuclear power plant, I think also makes them suitable for the continent. Totally agree. Thank you. Now, I just want to broaden up the um, discussion on what uh, Murray raised, and I want to focus particularly uh, with Andre and Brandon, who have uh, experience in finance and, and raising capital to support mining operations. The 
uh, in Paladin, uh, I was involved in two projects that had highly innovative pr processes. And the, the general uh, sort of approach is that, yes, there are good ideas out there, but because there's no example of their operations, they make, uh, they give a difficulty in terms of the finances, saying, oh yeah, you, you know, we've got this and that, and, and it certainly is a challenge. And I think Africa does need innovation uh, in, all, in, in its countries and, uh, and also to get more, more sort of cost competitive. So from a financial point of view, not just technical, um, uh, how do you see the, the financing of innovation uh, where there is no proven uh, operation that uh, these highly conservative people want to have to, to fortify uh, and uh, sort of minimise their risk? Uh, I guess, Andre, starting with you, the investment banker. I, you know, I think the, the, the big issue about conventional uh, nuclear is the upfront capital cost. But it's, it's, it's the up, upfront capital cost and, and the life of these reactors. I mean, modern reactors could run for 80 or 100 years. So I think it, it's very hard for private uh, balance sheets to, to finance heavy upfront capital and a very, very long repayment term. So, you know, where, where are conventional nuclear reactors being built? In China, Middle East, India, you know, we're using state balance sheets. So I think uh, back slightly to, to the SMR point, if, if you've got a lower upfront cost uh, and, and a shorter life, I think that is an easier um, project to, to finance from, from a commercial private perspective. Uh, and, I, and I think, you know, the, the, the question of innovation, it, it really depends on, on which, which part of the innovation chain you, you, you're talking about. You know, is it innovation all the way uh, at the start at, at sort of university, uh, um, you know, level or, or in, in, in sort of hotbeds of, of innovation around a, a particular technology? Silicon Valley was, was an example. Um, so, you know, I think, again, the private sector will get involved when there's visibility to cash flows. Um, and, and, you know, ideally uh, lower upfront capital and, and a, a visible time frame to, to repayment. Thank you. And Brandon, uh, applying that to, the, uh, mining, to a mining operation and uh, looking at the nanotechnologies which uh, Paladin pioneered, uh, heat bleach, which is still a new, it's, it's not new in the other commodities, but it is new. Uh, what uh, uh, Murray was talking about, uh, how, how do you uh, sort of take, take this? Well, it is certainly a challenge to try and innovate at the financing and construction stage of any mining project, not only uranium. And any investor relations consultant who's worth his salt will tell you to remove words like innovation and new technology and so on from investor presentations, financing decks, all of that type of material. Because as you pointed out, John, financiers don't like risk and they certainly don't like technology risk. So to use, I think a great example to use nanofiltration, uh, when we optimized our definitive feasibility study at a Tango in 2015, we were aware of the great work that you were doing uh, at Kailakera with uh, acid scavenging using nanofiltration and so on. But uh, we hadn't seen it operating sufficiently for us to be willing to increase the technical risk profile of our project. Um, now we've seen it operating there, also Langer Heinrich and one or two other parts of the world. And so we have incorporated that and we recently completed a membrane test work program to a definitive level that involved nanofiltration with some fantastic results. Um, now you don't, don't want to really be a trailblazer there when you're pre-production. It's much easier to innovate as a mining company once you're already in construction or in production better still, and then you can implement some of those operational improvements. Uh, the, the other um, point that I think is relevant here is we've got in uranium a significant proportion of the industry that is state-sponsored. So this is like a call to action really for the state-sponsored uranium companies who are typically owned in a vertical integration setup 
by customers or consumers of nuclear fuel. Um, really, the responsibility is on them to innovate and to uh, implement new technologies. They've got enormous balance sheets. They've got a lot more capacity to absorb risk than private investors or financiers. And I'd hope to see more innovation coming into the sector through those groups who in many cases have uh, close sovereign links. And so there's also something at stake for them to be able to be proving new technologies for the first time, unlike uranium companies who really are motivated by their financiers to try and stick to what's already been proven elsewhere. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, in the time available, there's two questions I'd really like to to discuss about and um, and which is relevant to uh, Africa. The thing about technology is, as, as Andre points out, there's technology at the, at the SMR end, right? And there's technology at the front end. So there's lots of different technology areas that we can improve on. And as you point out, technology is a dirty word. And as a potential um, or an explorer and a potential developer, uh, we've been using the word technology and actually changed it because, uh, you know, uh, financiers don't like the word technology. So another example I can bring out is, for instance, we looked at uh, a nickel um, technology in Australia where it's the whole flow sheet and stream 47 goes back to stream five. And if it's not quite right, then it doesn't work properly. Whereas say something like the upgrade process that we've developed is a straight through process. It uses commonly known and well-established unit operations that have been used in, in gold, um, base metals and also mineral sands. So there's different levels. That's what I'm saying here, John, is there's different levels of technology. So you could have a whole process that's very complicated, um, convoluted with streams, you know, reversing back of themselves, uh, or, or you can have a straight through process. So, so I think uh, to answer the question in terms of the financiers, it, it is the complexity uh, and where those unit operations have been used elsewhere. But as you say, innovations at the front end where we're working with, and it's also at the back end um, to improve, uh, you know, nuclear power generation. Thanks, Murray. Yeah, I, I think they are significant challenges, by the way, and but I think they are dealable, and um, and I think the the one of the uh, things to uh, uh, how you confront that is by not overemphasizing uh, what you're doing, that it's you know straight new and just put it as part of the system, and you're getting it through and, and you don't put the fear of whatever to these financiers. Um, just getting on to uh, Africa, and, uh, it's, and I want to talk about new entrants and in two ways. First of all, there are four countries in Africa that have got uh, uh, uranium mining experience. South Africa, Namibia, Malawi and Niger. And there are 14 countries that have uranium resources. So they're, they're, they're in as a challenge, and it was raised in the, uh, the intros. The other thing is, is that there are new entrants coming in as well. Uh, uh, and as the uranium boom starts, there'll be new players coming in and they will uh, form their own issues. So Brandon, what challenges do you think are facing uh, uh, the African new entrants on both sides, both in mining and export, and uh, you've got a bit some experience in this uh, from some UN work you're doing. Uh, I'd like to hear about it. Well, John, you also have a lot of experience having trailblazed in Malawi, uh, personally developing the Kailakera mine there. And uh, as you know, uranium is very different to other commodities. It's not the same as being the first gold mine to open up in the country, for example, or the first copper mine. And that's because there's just such a large, intricate and complex regulatory overlay that's required to produce and export uranium. Now, that's for extremely good reasons, of course, because of non-proliferation and security um, requirements of the IAEA. But what it does mean is that you need a huge degree of government support and therefore government capability to be able to produce and export uranium. It's not just what's inside your own company and what you can control and implement as your own company. So the government needs to be set up with a whole raft of IAEA uh, requirements to be able to export. They need to have suitable monitoring and enforcement capability of various regulations. 
And then the transport, and if, uh, if you're dealing with a country that has a port, the transport and shipping requirements to move and export class seven product, being uranium, is also very intricate and very involved. So you've got all of that on top of the challenges that we've talked about in terms of developing a uranium mine in the first place. So the environmental, social and political challenges, not to mention financial, which we're so deep in a bear market at the moment that we've forgotten. But as uh, uranium price continues to improve, those financial challenges might not be uh, front and centre. It'll come far more down to environmental, social, political and those types of regulatory capabilities. So that exists anywhere in the world, but in my experience in Africa, it's a particular challenge because uh, African bureaucracy and African government, uh, generally speaking, has a learning curve in front of it. And particularly with highly complicated matters such as nuclear physics, nuclear science, the complex regulatory uh, fabric of the IAEA requirements. So it certainly makes it a lot easier if you're developing a project from within a country like Namibia or Niger for that matter that have got 40 plus years of export experience. Yes, uh, and I agree. And I think that uh, when, you, when you think that um, in the last 50 years, uh, it has only been Malawi as a new a uranium country that has come into that fold and the rest is concentrated uh, in countries with existing uranium systems, the regulations, and the one before that was Niger when, uh, uh, when uh, Arano came in. So all I'm saying, all I think to add to that is those companies that do have operation there should, should look at a, a lead time that's maybe a lot a bit longer just to be able to uh, uh, make sure that everything's done uh, properly and correctly. Um, on another question, the um, on I and no doubt you in the panel have often heard read uh, this sort of comment, which is understandable. And this is not just an African issue. I've heard it in Australia that you know uh, we have uranium to mine. And the incorrect assumption then that you can support a domestic uh, uh, nuclear power uh, industry. After all, if you've got gas, you can say you can support your gas power station. Same with coal. And um, so that the, but uh, it's uh, the, can you discuss a bit, uh, starting with Andre uh, and following on with the others, that? Um, that connectivity, uh, you know, do you think that, uh, you know, it's something that's necessary, it's unnecessary? I, be I believe, by the way, uh, that uh, supply and, and nuclear reactors are, are two separate things, uh, two separate different industries, and uh, if you supply iron ore, you don't have to make cars in your country. So, uh, but it doesn't mean you don't benefit from that. So, Andre, just to... Yeah, John, I think the key difference, you know, if you look at coal, you can build a power station on top of a coal mine. You know, if you have a uranium mine, uh, having a nuclear reactor there, the product doesn't feed directly in. You know, the fuel value chain in, in this industry is, is complicated. It's, it, it takes a number of steps. So, and, and typically the fuel has to go offshore to get processed and, and upgraded. So I think uranium is different. Uh, you know, it, it's not like uh, the, the conventional uh, fossil fuels of, of gas and coal, which, which are easy to move. You know, they're pretty much in final product when they come out the mine. Uranium uh, is, is not such a product. Uh, Brandon, yes. <clears throat> well, thanks, John. And as you say, I've been working with the UN on just this matter. What advantages to a country that is contemplating incorporating nuclear power into their energy mix what advantages are there for having its own domestic uranium production? The, I agree entirely with Andre and many governments, they don't understand that the uranium needs to be shipped at least halfway around the world to a conversion facility and another halfway around the world sometimes to an enrichment and fabrication facilities before it can be shipped back to their African home country for nuclear fuel deployment. Um, there is one other relevant matter though in the work that I've been doing with governments 
and that is that having domestic uranium production, or at the very least resources, does give security of supply, which can increase a country's confidence when they are grappling with the decision about introducing nuclear power into their energy mix. And um, many people, and I'm sure you agree, John, believe that security of supply is going to become of critical importance in this sector, particularly from 2025 and onwards from 2028, as we see a very significant demand profile and the type of production depletion that we've already talked about. So for a country that's embarking on potentially an 80 or 100 year project to incorporate nuclear energy, to know that if push really comes to shove on a supply basis, that they have uranium resources or better still uranium production that can be drawn upon, uh, that helps with that confidence. Now, of course, it also opens up a Pandora's box of issues relating to the interaction between public or state uh, investment and private investment, because state investment has discovered very, very little uranium uh, beyond the, fall of the collapse of the Soviet Union. And so that's a lot of the advice that I've been given, how to enable a country to have confidence about its resources without chasing away the private sector, which has the absolute lion's share of success when it comes to discovering and developing uranium resources. Thank you, I, I agree. So now we'll move on to some questions from the floor. And, um, the, and, and we can talk about this uh, with the, the whole panel, starting with, uh, with Brandon. The, and one of the questions was that now that, uh, that there is a focus to have uh, uranium uh, enhanced power, produ uh, power production in Africa, and, and the person says, and it will, how safe is uranium and growth of the continental nuclear fleet in Africa while considering possibly weaker legislation and the need for this industry to be managed with the strongest regulatory framework and with its uh, uh, sort of zero, zero tolerance to, to mistakes. Um, just to preface that, uh, when, I, when, when we started in uh, uh, Malawi, who had no mining experience even, and never mined a uranium, um, I, I have some very good uh, experiences from that, but the amount of effort of learning, of really approaching it with company and government and the organizations out of Vienna was enormous. And, uh, and the, but there is a, a, a good side to this, but it's nevertheless is a challenge. Any comments on that? Yeah, look, I'd like to make three comments, I think. The, the first one is just nuclear power safety generally um, has been enormously distorted by the media, Hollywood, and uh, in some cases, governments who've used misinformation to progress their own uh, political agendas. Um, if, if viewers can go to Visual Capitalist, for example, and look up Ura uh, nuclear energy safety, by far, by far, uh, as measured per fatality for the energy output, nuclear power is the lowest. lowest than, lower than solar, lower than wind, an awful lot lower than hydro, and of course, um, a tiny fraction of what coal and other hydrocarbons have inflicted in terms of fatalities measured by energy output. Now, look, the second point, there's a little bit of African prejudice, I think, behind the question that's been asked, John. There's, I sometimes hear people say, well, you know, it, they point to, for example, African road fatalities, and they want to extrapolate what that must mean for the potential to have nuclear power on the continent. And I just believe that that doesn't follow. You know, South Africa's operated nuclear power plants at Coburg for uh, three decades without any incidents. And also, as we discussed before, SMRs, the small modular reactors that represent the future of nuclear power for smaller grids as exist in Africa, they're inherently safe. They have passive shutdown features. Uh, you can fly rockets and planes into them and they, they're perfectly safe. So 
they represent an entirely safe solution, even if you come to the equation with a little bit of African prejudice about your belief in African countries to control risks. And the third point that I'd make, John, is the nuclear industry is quite dominated by a small handful of vendors of nuclear power stations or nuclear power technology who have the strongest possible vested interest in making sure that nuclear power continues to be safe. And these vendors have got such enormously large order books at stake that they would not take any risks whatsoever to sell, deliver, construct a nuclear power plant into an environment where there's the potential for it to be unsafe. And if you just look at the um, record in recent decades or decade or recent years from those big vendors, uh, Electricity de France, Rosatom, Westinghouse, and, and also the, um, the new kid on the block, which is the uh, Chinese technology, they're going to absolutely bend over backwards to make sure that as nuclear power is expanded in Africa, that it's 100% safe. Thanks. Uh, Andre and Murray, any, anything to add to that? No, not, not really. I think, you know, uh, Africa has, has, has operated, you know, mines for, 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 for very long periods of time. So there's a, a resource skill set. And, and I agree with, with Brandon that, you know, the specifics around nuclear are different in, in, in terms of the concentration of technology supplies and, and their interest over a long term. Okay. Barry? Uh, nothing really. I mean, people tend to put Africa in, as the continent into one basket, but we know, you know, Namibia, Botswana, great countries to operate. Other ones further north, a little bit different. So, you know, I think it's, it's, it's almost like putting the Americas into one basket. Um, you know, the US versus, you know, some of the lesser South American countries. So I think, you know, people just have to look at each country on its merits as opposed to putting them into a one basket and believing that, you know, Africa is, is an issue. Fair point. Uh, I'll need to combine uh, the next question uh, from that floor. It concerns uh, new technologies and, and uh, new fuels uh, like depleted uranium, uh, thorium, and even some of the uh, SMRs that will use enriched uranium, sort of the 20% uh, enriched. And um, the, and, uh, you know, the Bill Gates Foundation that are, that are funding this. And the question was asked, you know, will, will the need for conventional uranium uh, be uh, sort of continue? And will the depleted uranium stock of which there are huge, huge abundance uh, there, uh, at the and and the amount of thorium, recognising that the thorium industry hasn't advanced for 30, 40 years, although there's a huge amount of research and uh, fast neutron, fast breeders are, are, are there in sort of uh, more than just uh, paper drawings, but you know China will uh, get some of these going. So the first part of my question is: Do you think the uh, the need uh, uh, will be less for uranium in that in that big term, and the um, and, and the uh, yes the, the uh, and the traditional fuels will they come down? So um, again, uh, Brandon, I'll start off with you. Yeah, thanks, John. And look for the folks in the audience out there. John and I both sit on the World Nuclear Association's Nuclear Fuel Demand Working Group, which I chair. So these are issues that we spend a lot of time thinking about and John and I spend a lot of time talking about. So the, the question about fast breeder reactors, in other words, they are reactors that run on nuclear fuel that's already spent or already been used. And this works because in a conventional reactor, it, despite the incredible power output and energy density of uranium in that nuclear fuel, it still only uses a small proportion of that energy in its first run. So I don't believe that we're going to see small modular reactors or fast breeder reactors cannibalizing the market for, first of all, conventional nuclear reactors or fresh mined uranium anytime soon. And I say that because they are a different market. As we've been talking about in the African context, 
you can extrapolate that to a whole range of scenarios in other parts of the world where SMRs have got their most ideal applicability where conventional nuclear reactors don't fit. So they will add to nuclear fuel demand rather than suppress the demand for fresh uranium supplies. And in many respects, it's arguable that the availability of these technologies will in fact increase the public acceptance and therefore the trajectory of development of conventional nuclear power stations. Um, now, the other thing is that the, there is a large quantity of spent fuel or um, depleted tails and other forms of uh, nuclear material out there, but it isn't as cheap as mining uranium even despite the vast gap that we've got between current uranium prices and the necessary price to bring on new development in this sector. So it's a little bit like saying, well, there's a huge amount of zinc sitting in all the tailings dams in the world. Look, uh, statistically, that'd be perfectly correct. You could do the analysis and you could identify a huge amount of zinc sitting in tailings dams around the world. But the real question is, how much of that zinc can be extracted economically? Because it is a complex technological process to extract usable nuclear fuel out of those various forms of depleted fuel. And the final thing I'd say to this, John, which is really fascinating is, as the sector does move more towards using depleted fuel sources or recycled fuel sources in fast breeder reactors, that will finally lay the claim for nuclear power to be regarded truly as a renewable energy source. And that itself is a huge enabler. I think that's uh, a few decades away still, but that is very much real technology. It's only a question of economics today. Thank you. Um, anything to add to that, uh, gentlemen on the panel? I think the only thing I would say is, you know, over the long term, technology wins. But I think I agree with, with Brandon. This is a 10 year plus time horizon that we're talking about, uh, you know, I, I think uh, the, the SMR commercialization is a much more visible uh, opportunity, I think. Yes, and, um, and, I, and I do believe that um, these, these uh, technologies will coexist, like the petrol and diesel, and it'll be 50 years more of this coexistence each phasing in, and there'll be needs, as Brandon says, on... Uh, uh, courses for courses in, uh, in this complicated uh, energy environment. Well, look, we've run out of uh, time uh, on this. Uh, time has gone quickly. I, I, I really like to thank everybody. But I, uh, just to, reiter to reiterate, uh, I think Africa, we agree, is a, 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 an exciting continent, one of uh, abundant uranium and uh, an opportunity for uh, investors and governments alike. Um, it is a continent of the 21st century in terms of uh, growth and development. And, and I think um, sessions like this and uh, uh, what the, uh, uh, the uh, summit, uh, the African summit is doing are very, very worthwhile and um, uh, in this regard. So I thank you all and uh, over to the uh, convener. Thank you.